Pardon the interruption, I'm Chris Garrett. Sam, July 26th, today is the 130th birthday of the language Esperanto. How's your Esperanto these days? Bon venon pardoni la interamcon. Estas tempo por comenci la spectaclan. <laughs> Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. I'm Sam Mulberry. Chris, uh, exam two is now behind us. So before we dive into unit three, uh, unit three material, what uh, observations or takeaways do you have from the second exam? Sure. Um, I mean, I'd say people seem to take the advice you guys did suggest the last time. They took the essay really seriously. Everyone had pretty well developed like four paragraph essays, you know, kind of to varying degrees of understanding Ed Fontes, but I had a couple that were just kind of dazzling. Um, a couple of like objective sections that are, for at least some students, were a little bit weaker than you'd think. Um, one is the map. I, I had a student, I don't know if they came in caught off guard by this, but we're like, how do I study for a map quiz, right? And like, well, you need to kind of know every vocabulary term where it would happen. One resource I'd point out, if you haven't noticed, um, I think all the museums actually have a lot of maps in them. Like if you go back to the Reformation Museum, there's a map at the entrance, then each of the traditions has maps. Um, there's one, I think, at the back of the Enlightenment Museum, if you didn't notice this past time. Um, there are maps in the Modern Age Museum. And then, of course, your textbook is full of maps. So there, like, I don't think it takes a lot of effort, but like, if geography is not your strong suit, that's an easy way. To right, and I would say the question stuff. to ask yourself is, you know, when you're going through the vocab and you're writing down where someone's from, mm -hmm. always ask yourself, do I know where that is? Yeah. And if you don't, it's pretty easy to, I mean, it's pretty easy to even do a Google search on Spain and be like, okay, well, that's where Spain is. Yeah, I mean, you basically you know. need to know countries. Yeah. Like, I mean, with very few exceptions, it's not like we're asking you to know the difference between two cities 20 miles apart in mm -hmm. Germany. Or where is the Basque region or something like that. <laughs> Is it? That would be a tricky one to put on. Um, the other one is quotations. I had um, maybe two or three students. My guess is because they started with the essay, they probably spent a little more time. And then I think with quotations, they left some things unselected. The thing about quotations is like, obviously, you can search a PDF. You can find those. We get it. Like, But if you've actually been doing the readings, like these should not be hard. If you're kind of familiar with the readings, and this is the shortest reading packet for Unit 3, you know, you should be able to blow through that pretty quickly. So there really is not a shortcut. Like you're either going to use time in the objective section and shorten your time for the essay, or you're going to prepare really well and have lots of time for all. Right, that. and I will say, I mean, there's some questions about is you know is is 75 minutes an arbitrary time, or why do we have it? So that's that's what we give students in the face-to-face -face course, and students in this course have the advantage of notes and all right. I mean which is also a disadvantage if you're not prepared this is why if you go back to those early webisodes we kept saying organize your notes so you can access that stuff quickly because if you're spending time really going through trying to find stuff you're probably actually not doing what you should be doing on the test. Now, the tricky part here is that the third unit is um, actually our shortest unit. Can you say a little something, Sam, about the compressed nature of unit three? You yeah, know, I mean, we're, week, right? we're, it's, it's funny because we're not covering, it's not that we're covering this huge amount of time compared to other units. It's just there's a lot, uh, there, there's a lot going on there. So, so each, um, each, this unit has two museums and two films, I believe, correct? I think so. Yeah, yeah. so which is shorter than, than the other units. Usually we've had either three museums, three films, things like that. So, so it's going to come at you really quickly. Now, part of that is you're going to get some choice as you're going mm -hmm. through, especially I know in the, the final museum for this, uh, for this unit, there's a lot. Uh, even the, the museum worksheet is going to have yeah. you pick a path and go down yeah. a little bit more. Um, but I think it's, that makes it extra important to pay attention to what, what does the study guide say? What is the vocab mm -hmm. that you need to know? And make sure you really have that stuff because um, there's a lot of details you can get lost in as this gets, as the, the, the rate picks up. I think one of the challenges is that there's some like, there are key individuals, key events. Um, there are also just like a lot of big concepts. Like a lot of the webisodes today, we're going to be reviewing kind of concepts that you need to master. Um, like you really need to know what is the Enlightenment and the worksheet that you just finished, you know, try to get you to think about like how Dan Ritchie defined it and some of the values of it and how Christians respond. When you get to the last worksheet um, on the modern age, we're actually kind of looking ahead beyond our time frame, and we'll talk about what we'll call mental furniture. So as you get into that museum, be sure to watch a short little kind of narrated PowerPoint where we lay out what those big values, ideas, um, kind of concepts are.
Um, uh, so Sam, if you had to pick then, so let's dive back to the scientific revolution. We've got a few readings there. If you had to pick just one of them that you really would want students to master, like they could come away from this course totally understanding what that author, what that scientist was getting at, what, what would be the one you'd really want them to master? This is actually harder than you think because there's there's a number of readings that I, I really love and I, and I think... Uh, I mean, there's a degree to which, like, I, 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 I wish the Pascal reading was just at the core of our students, because yeah. like, I, to me, that, uh, that reading, and it, maybe it's just personal, it touches on, on my particular view of faith and reason. Uh, but I think I would pick the Galileo mm -hmm. reading, uh, because he's really, I feel like he, you know, writing this in the early 1600s, he is, he is speaking to our age pretty well still in terms of how do we wrestle with. A world where science is this thing of high value and it's telling you one thing and then there's interpretations of scripture and it's telling you another and he's i think he's he's hitting that straight on and you know i mean he asked some important questions I, this, is fun, this is a fun one to walk through with students mm -hmm. and just be like you know he says he thinks the scriptures are important he starts with that but then you know he says well kind of like what are this what's the point of scripture so what would you say the purpose of scripture is chris wow in like three seconds yeah, yeah. Uh, the purpose of scripture is, at its core um i think it's a way to mediate our relationship to god okay so it helps us understand our relationship with god who god is how we live in relationship with him grace mercy forgiveness mm -hmm. salvation right sure. and galileo says these are the most important things yeah. is it a physics textbook not so much no so but basically he's saying let's just not use it as that you know and and and, and he's saying that the, the bible's in some ways he's saying the bible's too important to read it literally in terms of this and if you Imagine the Bible if it said, does all the things it does now, but it also taught you about planetary motion. How confusing that would be, especially to people in the first century AD. I think it's really interesting because we present that as a scientific revolution text, and it is. But keep in mind, Galileo is living through the age of religious warfare, the kind of aftermath of the Reformation. You could also think of it as a response to Gutenberg, you know, unleashing the Bible, making it more widely available, vernacular translation, and then the Protestants saying that this one book is our authority. You know, I mean, he's responding to that change mm -hmm. as much as to what Copernicus is unleashing in science. So I, I agree. I think it's a really pivotal text for some of those right. streams kind of run into it. It's, it's also an interesting moment where it's where he's where what we're what we're moving away from in the Middle Ages. A, Aquinas is the great intellect of the Middle Ages. What is he an expert on? He's an expert on everything, right? That's the idea is it's the synthesis. Everything's tied together. And Galileo's pulling that apart and saying, no, no, you, the church theologians, you guys are experts on this stuff over here. Yeah. I'm an expert on astronomy, so don't tell me about astronomy unless you've studied it. Right. And the same way he'll say, I'm not going to tell you about scripture and theology unless I've studied it. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't disagree with this idea that all truth is God's truth, but there are different sources for those different truths, and I think that's really important. There are different callings for different people to um, focus in, to specialize in those different truths. So, Chris, uh, the Enlightenment, um, we talked last time about the Renaissance not being one of your favorite time periods. The Enlightenment is another time period you're well, not I, a huge fan I'm of. I'm just curmudgeonly. I just yeah, hate everything. As, a, as like a modern historian, <laughs> you kind of, you don't like to cast that stuff aside. Yeah. Uh, Make your best case for, like, what do you like about the Enlightenment, or why is it important? Sure. I don't, I don't teach this class as much as I used to, but I did teach a class on human rights and international history. And I think it would be pretty curmudgeonly of me to dismiss the Enlightenment. And I think there's some problems with it, but, like, as much as anything, it does help introduce this idea that... Um, um, there's this thing called universal, natural, inalienable rights that are equally available to all human beings, not because they've earned them or because they belong to the right family or social class or because they're Christian or in something else, but because they're human. And the Enlightenment, you know, is imperfect and, you know, corners of it tolerate slavery and, and corners of it side with absolute monarchs. And yet it's giving us um, the vocabulary of human rights, and it's starting to initiate some political movements that start to give more and more people human rights. And, you know, we can debate exactly what those rights are and how we realize them, but I think that is unquestionably a, a good innovation in human history because it just doesn't exist. Like, I mean, I tend to tell my students, you could root this in Christianity or Judaism and the idea that Genesis says we're all created in the image of God, but that doesn't show up. Like medieval Christendom does not have an idea that all people are equal. It has an idea that all people are placed in a hierarchy and certain people have more power and privileges than others. And um, I will not poo-poo the idea of human rights. And I think we can thank the Enlightenment for it. Is there anything you especially like about it beyond human rights? Uh, I mean, that that's that's 
a, a big one for me. I also just think there's so much of the modern world that's rooted in those in that between the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. I mean, I think when we get to this point in the course, I often tell students like this stuff should look familiar. This is it's the bedrock on which our society is founded. Now there's lots of problems with that bedrock and and especially in the 20th and 21st century, it's been picked away at quite a bit. But I think it's in, it's really important to understand in order to understand the modern world. Yeah, I think you've used the image of this is like a distant mirror, right? And maybe that feels more distant back in the ancient world or literature. Now it should start coming into focus. You should start seeing yourself, mm -hmm. not perfectly, but you can start seeing, oh, that's where that comes from. That's why I think that way. Um, Let's, before we close this segment, let's just talk a little bit about the discussion board post. Uh, the last two units, we've actually put this as part of our Make the Case game. Don't worry, we'll play Make the Case again in just a second. This discussion board post will be a little bit different. Because we've just been talking about the scientific revolution and the age of reason, we'd like you to reflect on your experience of science to this point. And this might vary. Some of you are coming out of high school into college. So you might want to think about a chemistry or a physics or a biology class you've just taken. Some of you have got a couple of years of college under your belt. Think about courses you've taken. Uh, either here at Bethel or another place. Some of you are science majors. Some of you are science majors. So I think kind of couch in terms of your experience, but you'll see that we're going to ask you to think about where have you encountered either tension or the perception or the expectation of tension. Yeah, I think that's kind of the simple story we tend to take away is that faith and science butt heads with each other. But you know, hopefully you've noticed you've got people like Galileo and Pascal and others thinking, no, these continue to work. We're kind of curious what this has looked like in your own experience of science. So um, here we're really thinking about your own experience. If you can bring in Galileo or Pascal or Descartes, that's great. Uh, feel free to do so. Um, I think we'd ask that you can start a new thread, like maybe you want us to talk about chemistry. No one's talked about chemistry or psychology and no one's done that. If, however, someone else has already kind of raised an idea you want to talk about, please do respond to them. Don't just start a new thread that repeats what five other people have said. Um, and so that's what we're looking for by 10 o'clock tomorrow. Welcome back. Uh, Amy, you are you are uh, joining us for segment two I here. I am. And we are going to play a little Make the Case. Excellent. Now, we haven't actually, we've never faced each other in Make we the Case haven't. before. So, no. And we're really good friends, and there's a lot of I tension know, here. But, but, but no punches pulled today. Yeah. All right? And we have a studio audience. That's today, right. So, <laughs> um, so our, our first question is, true or false, uh, aside from Jesus, Isaac Newton is the single most important person we talk about in this course. <laughs> so true is pro-Newton, false is anti-Newton. Right. Well, <laughs> Just anti-Newton being anti the most Newton. important. Yeah. Most of us are anti-Newton, right. right? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> All right. Uh-huh, yep. You get to go first. I do. Well, first of all, I think that... Um, there is no denying that it's true that Isaac Newton is the most important per, important person that we talk about in this course besides Jesus because you and I are sitting here right now and you're not falling out of your chair and you're not floating away and neither am I. Oh, look at that. Did everybody see it? I think that we all did. That's something that we can agree upon. But I think that Isaac Newton, I mean, he's an interesting figure, I think, beyond just what, um, I shouldn't say just what he discovers and what he develops in terms of these confirmations of the heliocentric theory and the idea of being able to prove that gravity is something that we, that, that all of nature um, is subject to. But I think that um, the the fact that you have ideas that develop and then over time they get debunked or over time they get um, expanded upon to the point that we realize that there's a piece of the, the puzzle that was missing and yet in this case, nope, he was right, he's still right, and we just continue to build upon um, what he discovered. And um, it's also, though, this fusion of this happening in a period of time where we see this intersection between trying to figure out how do we go about finding truth and how do we incorporate multiple sources as we go about that. So um, I don't know how, how long we want to go out this, but I feel like, is there any denying it? Who is, who's not going to be a believer in what Newton has to offer? So... Here, again, here we still are. I think the evidence the evidence speaks for <laughs> well, itself. I, I, I really like your argument, and there's lots of ways where I was hoping to get <laughs> I was hoping to get true on this one because it's yeah. it's undeniable <laughs> it's undeniable that Newton fundamentally yeah. just shifts the understanding. Yeah. Of it. I mean, and it, again, it, there's been no shift. Well, and I mean, it's rare no that you see back. yeah you see a worldview yeah. shift that's that almost immediate. Mm -hmm. You know, like like mm -hmm. like. You know, when and you, when indisputable. You look, right. When you look at the when you look at the Enlightenment, so much of that I mean, these are just the children of Newton. Yes. But I have false. Oh. And here's the thing. 
we could celebrate Newton in that way. And it's probably not a bad idea that we do. And I think he's unbelievably important. The problem is, I think, in making the case that he's the most important, um, aside from Christ, is that's a very modern way of viewing it. Because we're, yeah. we're still children of Newton. We're still living in his wake. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now, uh, a thousand years from now, we don't know what the understanding of the world will be. Maybe, maybe when we get a little bit more distance, we will say... Well, yeah, Newton was important, but we've shifted so far away from that now that it actually, I mean, maybe it's a 500, 600 year blip, but it's a, but it's a blip in terms of this, this, this um, longer span of history. I mean, if you had asked somebody, if you had asked somebody in the Middle Ages, (laughs) I don't know if you, if you had asked somebody in the Middle Ages, I mean, obviously they wouldn't have said Newton because Newton didn't exist, but who shaped their worldview deeply? I mean, I think Augustine is the, is the Newton of 1500, you know, so, so I'm just saying if we get... If we get that kind of distance, you know, 700 years from Newton, it would be interesting. So all I'm saying is I want to pull back a little bit because we are still so closely attached to the world Newton creates. Now, I realize it's 400 years ago. There's right. been some time. Right. But, and, but. I, and I agree with you. At the same time, we could, we could, make, we could use that as an argument against anything against any sure question. sure so, as i said i wanted true <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, For once so, it went my way all right second question yes the more interesting century mm. the 17th century or the 18th century Ooh. we will go chronologically okay oh. Amy got 18th the century. 18th century. I had the 17th you go century. For it. Go you for know it. what the 17th century was? What? It's the century of Newton. <laughs> well, you have me there. Although I'd like to point out that the 18th, 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries right. are also the centuries so, of Newton. So here's, here's how I make the case for the 17th century. The 17th century is the century when a lot of the significant ideas that are going to... We've talked a lot about how this scientific revolution enlightenment shapes the modern world. A lot of those core ideas, the core thinkers, even the, the core thinkers for the people in the 18th century are coming out of the 17th yeah. century. So you have Galileo, you have Newton, you have Locke. I think Newton and Locke alone probably win this for me. Agreed, but, 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 okay, I'm oh, sorry, are you, are, you, okay. are you done? No. We are. <laughs> no, so, so, I mean, I, I, I really do think that that's, that, that everything we see after that, um, in terms of looking at, especially the 18th century, is a playing out of those ideas that those ideas are i mean that's the century of the monuments that everybody's wrestling with as we go forward right so this is the century so i mean 17th century is the birth of these ideas but 18th century is the implementation of these ideas what was the state of democracy in the 17th century right well we can talk about the emerging democracies in the 18th century so i think i'm going to build on what you say and say yeah that's all significant but the actual implementation of it is what we see happening in the 18th century we also see um, again this continued questioning and a lot of advancements for when i say advancements i mean I can't really say advancements for women in the sense that women all of a sudden have these rights, but we actually see the emergence of new voices and not only new voices, but um, respect for those voices and voices that we continue to look to because they did shape and then have an impact on sort of laying the foundation for the rights of women. And then we think about rights for um, the the challenges to slavery, the abolition of slavery, or the, the movements towards the abolition of slavery in some cases. And then um, the dawn of the modern era. And so also in the 18th century, and what's a little bit tricky about this is that there are some individuals that are significant in the 18th century, but you haven't you haven't gotten to them yet because they haven't, the way that we break up the films means they haven't quite been covered. But we need to talk about the Great Awakening. We need to talk about the the, the development of the evangelical movement um, in America that we are still obviously are significantly shaped by. So great, yes, agreed. Ideas emerge, but um, ideas mean nothing. It's all about the game-changing paradigm shift of the 17th century. Okay. <laughs> all right, third, third, uh, third question. Um, if you were to show Ben Franklin's list of his five essential religious beliefs, so these is when we talked yeah. about deism, we talked about this, to Christians that we've encountered in this course, which would they, what would they see as the most glaring omission from his list? So, okay. so what would they say, that's great, Ben, but... Yeah, dot, dot, um, dot. the thing that I think about when you look at this, and if you look at, at Franklin's list, you know, as I go through it, I go, agree, 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 agree. So this isn't about disputing the list, but it's this idea of what's missing. And I think that 
you know, what's missing is the whole idea of redemption, um, the whole idea of uh, the fact that we, um, that central to our Christian faith is the idea that we are sinners in need of being saved and that that salvation comes through Jesus Christ and that we are a forgiven population. And I know that, um, you know, the older I get, the more important that means to me, the idea that um, this kind of juxtaposition between the fact that each day I know that I'm lost and yet I'm saved and that each day I know that I'm, um, you know, I'm, I, I make errors and yet I am forgiven and that I am in desperately in need of being saved each and every day. And so that dependency upon a savior and the central idea of um, what it means to really be a new creation in Christ and the fact that when you accept and receive Christ and the idea of his salvation as central to who you are as a part of being renewed, but this notion that we're renewed every day and the idea that like um, God's mercies are new for us every morning. So that, that idea of renewal, the idea of being redeemed, the idea of um, being forgiven and, that, and, and, and the activeness in um, asking for forgiveness and receiving forgiveness and living in mercy are things I think that are missing here. So What I like about this question is I don't have to argue with you. I no. can just argue with Franklin because no, no. I agree right. with everything you right. just said. <laughs> Um, the, the thing that I would say that, that that's missing and that I think a lot of historical Christians would point out is, and, and I'm kind of folding two things into this, is that uh, for Franklin, God's not particularly personal mm-hmm. and he's very distant. Okay. So, I mean, and those are kind of the same thing, kind of different. So there's there's very se- little sense of any kind of relation relational God or relationship with God, which runs counter to any reading of scripture, I feel like. Um but uh, but there's also the distance of God has to do with the fact that that God's lack of activity in this yeah. world that there is the door is really closed to as as any you'd see in any good deist uh, is closed to the miraculous in the world to something which uh, is transrational goes against rationality um, there's just no possibility left open for that and I think the experience of most Christians historically uh, is open to that and I would say. Maybe most, and I say historically looking backwards, I would say maybe just most Christians. Period. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, even if even if there's probably big pockets of twentieth, twenty first century Western Christianity that's not super comfortable with that. Uh, globally, Christianity is pretty open to that, even in our, even in our current world. So, um, so I think those are the things that I would point to um, that that would would jump out. That that you know, if if Augustine or Luther or Tertullian would look at look at Franklin they would say what about this yeah you're, you're missing you're missing this. and I think that um you know what we've this is a challenge for students in terms of because what we've said is connected right it's like what's central to what's driving Augustine what's driving Luther it's it's this idea of like I know I'm not good enough. Mm-hmm. I know I'm not, and it's and and I want to. I I, I know I can't be good enough, and yet um, that's what's pulling them into wanting to know God and Christ more intimately. Is the idea of, but do you still love me? Um, because that's what I want from you. Is I want to be loved, not just to know that there's a creator who exists and who is in control. I deeply want you to be to be. I want to be accepted by that creator. Um, so go on to the uh, discussion bo- the discussion board, or go on to Moodle and uh, and vote to see who won. So we'll break this down. I don't know how you're going to vote on the last yeah. one, but I'm curious to see how you vote yeah. on that. Just remind yourself, you're sitting in your chair at your computer without any kind of apparatus to keep you strapped there. So. Okay, welcome back. It's time for Happy Happies. Amy, you ready? I'm ready. Okay, let's do this. This is posthumous, but happy birthday to Gracie Allen, born yeah. this day in 1895. George and Gracie. They're, they're great. I, I hope people know who Gracie Allen is. I hope that is. they do, Go too. Wikipedia. Uh, Were Amy, you a big Star Trek fan? Can we I just was. Yeah. Was it Star Trek Four? Was that the one where the with whales. the whales? With George and Gracie. Yeah, anyway. No. Okay, anyway, Amy, Nerd who's alert. your favorite <laughs> living comedian? Hmm, that's a tough one. I don't... Um, like, you know, I mean, comedian is kind of a difficult thing to interpret in terms of, like, are we talking about somebody who solely does stand-up comedy? Mm-hmm. Are we talking about somebody that does film work? And so I guess I'm going to probably say um, another Amy. I'm going to choose Amy uh, Poehler. Good choice. Yeah, just because of how much I love Parks and Rec and how much joy that it brings to me and the fact that overall, with the, if you're a Parks and Rec watcher, with the exception of how mean they are to Jerry, which I always feel like actually does not really quite fit in with the with the, with the the characters' personalities on the rest of the show, but I feel like this is a show that it's it's hard to think of something that's actually sort of more uplifting and sweet-spirited and yet is um, biting and cutting and hilarious and so I'm going to go with you. There are a lot of good that. choice. I was even thinking about the new Ghostbusters. Oh, movie. yeah, you got yeah. you there. You've got yeah. Melissa McCarthy, Leslie yeah. Jones, 
Kristen Wiig. Kristen and, Wiig, yeah. Uh, Kate McKinnon, yep. right? Um, but I'll go with Amy Kirsten Poehler's. Kirsten Wiig, I think. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Amy Poehler's <laughs> better half, right? Tina Fey. I think yeah, is, yeah. I mean, in terms of like encompassing, you know, she actually did do stand up and improv, but. And like, they're writers. Writing I mean, and yeah. Performing mm -hmm. and producing. And you know, I kind of want to say Ellie Kemper because of Kimmy Schmidt. But anyway, let's, let's move on. And they're moms. <laughs> okay. So that's a pretty big deal. Happy anniversary, Executive Order 9981, by which President Harry Truman ended segregation in the United States Armed Forces. Chris, where does this rank in the pantheon of executive orders? Um, it, it's kind of a timely topic. There's a lot yeah. of discussion around executive power. President Obama has issued, I don't know if he's got the most now, but he's had to rely on this more with Congress being divided. You know, I, I guess it actually starts with the Lincoln administration and the Civil War. Obviously, it was difficult to enact things in the middle of that conflict. And, you know, most famously, the Emancipation Proclamation is an executive order. Yeah. That's a little bit too easy, so I'll go a little bit deeper and... One that's easy to overlook is in the middle of the New Deal, Franklin Roosevelt has to do this, and one of his executive orders creates the, the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, which does all sorts of really interesting, interesting. things, a lot mm -hmm. of them in the realm of art, of photography, of architecture. I used to drive under like WPA bridges in Connecticut all the time. You can find these in, in Minnesota as well. Um, it does some things that are really important for historians. They do like yeah. oral history projects and collecting traditional music yep. and like slave, you know, slave the last of slave narrative mm -hmm. recording. So I, I think it's a really interesting thing. It's the kind of thing our political system would normally kind of yeah. bring to the surface. And so that's maybe a good use of the executive order. Okay, Amy, happy trails to We've Got Your Backman. To the best of my knowledge, we've received no pictures of our beloved textbook from various I actually travels. was thinking about this and I went back. I don't think we actually ever solicited them. Oh, we did. Oh, we did? Where Sam and I, I? talked, you were in oh, Japan. I Sam and I, I talked about this well. all the time <laughs> in the first two episodes. You didn't send any pictures from Japan, oh. apparently. I didn't send any from the North Shore last week, so I think we're at fault as much as anyone. We are. That's a bummer. Maybe it's not too late, though. It's not too we late. We'll still put it on. Yeah. Or, take so your backman somewhere, the beach, the factory, wherever that you can think of, and send us a picture from you and your backman. Target. Yes, take your matter. backman to the factory. <laughs> take your, your backman to the factory. I was just thinking of summer jobs. Yeah. Professor Mulberry's had That's really, he's do. worked in a factory. So you can email those. We're still open to questions. Maybe you want to weigh in yeah. on some of the things the we talked about. Cheesecake factory. <laughs> or that, if you're yep. in China. Um, and then, of course, vote on Make the Case on Moodle. It's it's actually a very tight competition here getting into the home stretch of the summer. Yep. And remember to complete your discussion board post and your experience of science courses, classes, majors. Yeah. Anything else, Amy, before we go? I think that that's good. Okay. Yep. i got to be back at the factory. <laughs> All right. So, kids, turn off the iPads. <laughs> We're done. <laughs>